Chapter 3 Pasteur Lisan, Hendricks remembered very well. Even now, in his old age, he was a vigorous personality, but in his youth he had been almost revolutionary. Wild enough, too, it was rumored, until he had turned to God of his own accord as offering a larger field for his strenuous vitality. The little man was possessed of tireless life, a born leader of forlorn hopes. Attack his metia and heavy odds the conditions that he loved. Before settling down in his isolated spot, Pasteur de l'Église Indépendante in a Protestant canton, he had been a missionary in remote pagan lands. His horizon was a big one. He had seen strange things. An uncouth being, with a large head upon a thin and wiry body, supported by steely bowed legs. He had that courage which makes itself known in advance of any proof. Hendricks slipped over to La Cure about nine o'clock and found him in his study. Lord Ernie was asleep. At least, his light was out, no sound or movement audible from his room. The Choran had swept the heavens of clouds. Stars shone brilliantly. The fires still blazed faintly upon the heights. The visit was not unexpected, for Hendricks had already sent a message to announce himself, and the moment he sat down, met the pasteur's eye, heard his voice, and observed his slight imperious gestures, he passed under the influence of a personality stronger than his own. Something in Laysan's atmosphere stretched him, lifting his horizon. He had come chiefly, he now realized it, to borrow help and explanation with regard to Lord Ernie. The events of two hours before had impressed him more than he quite cared to own, and he wished to talk about it. But, somehow, he found it difficult to state his case. No opening presented itself, or rather, the pastor's mind, intent upon something of his own, was too preoccupied. In reply to a question presently, the tutor gave a brief outline of his present duties, but omitted the scene of excitement in the village street, for as he watched the furrowed face in the light of the study lamp, he realized both anxiety and spiritual high pressure at work below the surface there. He hesitated to intrude his own affairs at first. They discussed, nevertheless, the psychology of the boy and the unfavorable chances of regeneration while the old man's face lit up and flashed from time to time, until at length the truth came out, and Hendricks understood his friend's preoccupation. "'What you're attempting with an individual,' Laysan exclaimed with ardor, "'is precisely what I'm attempting with the crowd, and it's difficult, for poor sinners make poor saints, and the lukewarm I will spew out of my mouth. He made an abrupt, resentful gesture to signify his disgust and weariness, perhaps his contempt as well. Cut it down! Why cumbereth it the ground? A hard, uncharitable doctrine, began the tutor, realizing that he must discuss the parish before he could introduce Bindi's case effectively. You mean, of course, that there's no material to work on. No energy to direct, was the emphatic reply. My sheep here are... Real sheep, mere negative drink-sodden loafers without desire, hospital cases. I could work with tigers and wild beasts, but whoever trained a slug? Your proper place is on the heights, suggested Hendricks, interrupting at a venture. There's scope enough up there, or it used to be. Have they died out, those wild men of the mountains? And hit, by chance, the target in the bullseye. The old man's face turned younger as he answered quickly. Men like that, he exclaimed, do not die off. They breed and multiply. He leaned forward across the table, his manner eager, fervent, almost impetuous, with suppressed desire for action. There's evil thinking up there, he said suggestively. But by heaven, it's alive. It's positive, ambitious, constructive, with violent feeling and strong desire to work on. There is hope of some result. Upon vehement impulses like that, pagan or anything else, a man can work with a will. Those are the tigers. Down here, I had the slugs. He shrugged his shoulders and leaned back into his chair. Hendricks watched him, 
thinking of the stories told about his missionary days among savage and barbarian tribes. Born of the vital landscape, I suppose, he asked. Wind and frost and blazing sun. Their wild energy, I mean, is due to... A gesture from the old man stopped him. You know who started them upon their wild performances, he said gravely in a lower voice. You know how that ambitious renegade priest from the Valais chose them for his nucleus, then died before he could lead them out, trained and competent upon his strange campaign. You heard the story when you were with me as a boy. I remember Marston, put in the other, uncommonly interested. Marston, the boy who... He stopped, because he hardly knew how to continue. There was a minute's silence, but it was not an empty silence, though no word broke it. Laysan's face was a study. Ah, Marston, yes, he said slowly, without looking up. You remember him, but that is at my door, too, I suppose. His father was ignorant and obstinate. I might have saved him otherwise. He seemed talking to himself rather than to his listener. Pain showed in the lines about the rugged mouth. There was no one, you see, who knew how to direct the great life that woke in the lad. He took it back with him and turned it loose into all manner of useless enterprises, and the doctors mistook his abrupt and fierce ambitions for her, for the hysteria which they called the vestibule of lunacy. Yet small characters may have big ideas. They didn't understand, of course. It was sad, sad, sad. He hid his face in his hands a moment. Marston went wrong, then, in the end. For the other's manner suggested disaster of some kind. Hendricks asked it in a whisper. Lisson uncovered his face, looped his neck with one finger, and pointed to the ceiling. Hanged himself, murmured Hendricks, shocked. The pasteur nodded, but there was impatience, half anger in his tone. They checked it, kept it in. Of course it tore him. The two men looked into each other's eyes for a moment, and something in the younger of them shrank. This was all beyond his ken a little. An odd hint of bleak and cruel reality was in the air, making him shiver along nerves that were normally inactive. The uneasiness he felt about Lord Ernie became alarm. His conscience pricked him. More than he could assimilate, continued Lison. It broke him. Yet, had outlets been provided, had he been taught how to use it, this elemental energy drawn direct from nature. He broke off abruptly, struck, perhaps, by the expression in his listener's eyes. It seems incredible, doesn't it, in the twentieth century, I know. Evil, asked Hendricks, stammering rather. Why evil, was the impatient reply. How can any force be evil? That's merely a question of direction. And the priest who discovered these forces and taught their use, then, was genuinely spiritual and followed the truth in his own way. He was not necessarily evil. The little pasteur spoke with vehemence. You talk like the religion primers in the kindergarten, he went on. Listen. This man, sick and weary of his lukewarm flock, sought vital stalwart systems who might be clean enough to use the elemental powers he had discovered how to attract. Only the bias of the users could make it evil by wrong use. His idea was big and even holy, to train a core that might regenerate the world, and he chose unreasoning, unintellectual types with a purpose. Primitive giant men who could assimilate the force without risk of being shattered. Under his direction, he intended they should prove as effective as the twelve disciples of old who were fisher folk. And had he gone on? He too failed then, asked the other, whose tangled thoughts struggled with incredulity and belief as he heard this strange new thing. He died, you mean. Maison de Sante was the laconic reply. Straight waistcoats, padded cells, and the rest. But still alive, I'm told. It was more than he could manage. It was a startling story, even in this brief outline, deep suggestion in it. The tutor's sense of being out of his depth increased. After nine months with a lifeless, devitalized human being, this was, well, 
he seemed to have fallen in his sleep from a comfortable bed into a raging mountain torrent. Strong currents rushed through and over him. The lonely peaceful village outside, sleeping beneath the stars, heightened the contrast. Suppressed or misdirected energy again, I suppose, he said in a low tone, respecting his companion's emotion. And these mountain men, he asked abruptly, do they still keep up their practices? Their ceremonies, yes, corrected the other, master of himself again. Turbulent moments of nature, storms and the like, stir them to clumsy rehearsals of once vital rituals, not entirely ineffective, even in their incompleteness but dangerous for that very reason. This Sharan, for instance, invariably communicates something of its atmospherical energy to themselves. They light their fires as of old. They blunder through what they remember of his ceremonies. With the glasses, you may see them in their dozens, men and women, leaping and dancing. It's an amazing sight, great beauty in it, impossible to witness, even from a distance, without feeling the desire to take part in it. Even my people feel it, the only time they ever get alive. He jerked his big head contemptuously towards the street, or feel desire to act. And someone from the heights, the messenger perhaps, will be down later, this very evening probably, on the hunt. On the hunt? Hendricks asked it, half below his breath. He felt a touch of awe as he heard this experienced, genuinely religious man speak with conviction of such curious things. On the hunt, he repeated more eagerly. Messengers, do come down, was the reply. A living belief always seeks to increase, to grow, to add to itself. Where there's conviction, there's always propaganda. Ah, converts! Bisson shrugged his big black shoulders. Desire to add to their number. Desire to save, he said. The energy they absorb overflows. That's all. The Englishman debated several questions vaguely in his mind. Only his mind, being disturbed, could not hold the balance exactly true. Lisan's influence, as of old, was upon him. A possibility, remote, seductive, dangerous, began to beckon to him but from somewhere just outside his reasoning mind. And they always know when one of their kind is near, the voice slipped in between his tumbling thoughts, as though they get it instinctively from these universal elements they worship. They select their recruits with marvelous judgment and precision. No messenger ever goes back alone, nor has a recruit ever been known to return to the lazy squalor of the conditions whence he escaped. The younger man sat upright in his chair, suddenly alert, and the gesture that he made unconsciously might have been read by a keen psychiatrist as evidence of mental self-defense. He felt the forbidden impulse in him gathering force, and tried to call a halt. At any rate, he called upon the other man to be explicit. He inquired point-blank what this religion of the heights might be. What were these elements these people worshipped? In what did their wild ceremonies consist? And Hlisan, breaking bounds, let his speech burst forth in a stream of explanation, learned of actual knowledge, as he claimed, and uttered with the vehement conviction that produced an undeniable effect upon his astonished listener. Told by no dreamer, but by a righteous man who lived, not merely preached, his certain faith, Hendricks, before the half was heard, forgot what age and land he dwelt in. Whole blocks of conventional belief crumbled and fell away. Brick walls, erected by routine to mark narrow paths of proper conduct, safe, moral, advisable conduct, thawed and vanished. Through the ruins, scrambling at him from huge horizons never recognized before, came all manner of marvelous possibilities. The little confinement of modern thought appalled him suddenly. Lisan spoke slowly, said little, was not even speculative. It was no mere magic of words that made the dim-lit study swim these deep waters beyond the ripple of pert creeds, but rather the overwhelming sense of sure conviction driving behind the statements. The little man had witnessed curious things, yes, in his missionary days, and that he had found truth in them in place of ignorant nonsense was remarkable enough. 
that silly superstitions prevalent among older nations could be signs really of their former greatness, linked mightily close to natural forces, was a startling notion. But it paved the way in Hendrick's receptive mind just then for the belief that certain so-called elements might be worshipped, known intimately, that is, to the uplifting advantage of the worshippers. And what elements more suitable for adoring imitation than wind and fire? For in a human body, the first signs of what men term life are heat, which is combustion, and breath, which is a measure of wind. Life means fire, drawn first from the sun, and breathing, borrowed from the omnipresent air. There might credibly be ways of assaulting these elements and taking heaven by storm of seizing from their inexhaustible stores an abnormal measure, of straining this huge raw supply into effective energy for human use, vitality. Living with fire and wind in their most active moments, closely imitating their movements, following in their footsteps, understanding their laws of being, going identically with them, there lay a hint of the method. It was once when men were primitively close to nature, instinctual knowledge. The ceremony was the teaching. The powers of fire, the principalities of air, existed, and humanity could know their qualities by the ritual of imitation, could actually absorb the fierce enthusiasm of flame and the tireless energy of wind. Such transference was conceivable. Lisson, at any rate, somehow made it so. His description of what he had personally witnessed, both in wilder lands and here in this little mountain range of Middle Europe, had a reality in it that was upsetting to the last degree. There is nothing more difficult to believe, he said, yet more certainly true than the effect of these singular elemental rites. He laughed a short dry laugh. The medieval superstition that a witch could raise a storm is but a remnant of a once completely efficacious system, he concluded, though how that strange being, the valet priest, rediscovered the process and introduced it here, I have never been able to ascertain. That he did so, results have proved. At any rate, it lets in life, life, moreover, in astonishing abundance, though whether for destruction or regeneration depends, obviously, upon the use the recipient puts it to. That's where direction comes in. The beckoning impulse in the tutor's bewildered thoughts drew closer. The moment for communicating it had come at last. Without more ado, he took the opening. He told his companion the incident in the village street, the boy's abrupt excitement, his newfound energy, the curious words he used, the independence and vitality of his attitude. He told also of his parentage, of his mother's disabilities, his craving for rushing air in abundance, his love of fire for its own sake, of his magnificent physical machinery, yet of his uselessness. And Lisan, as he listened, seemed built on wires. Searching questions shot forth like blows into the other's mind. The pasteur's sudden increase of enthusiasm was infectious. He leaped intuitively to the thing in Hendrick's thought. He understood the beckoning. The tutor answered the questions as best he could, aware of the end in view with trepidation and a kind of mental breathlessness. Yet, unquestionably, Bindi had exchanged communication of some sort with the man, though his excitement had been evident even sooner. And you saw this man yourself, he saw and pressed him. Indubitably, a tall and hurrying figure in the dusk. He brought energy with him. The boy felt it and responded. Hendricks nodded. Became quite unmanageable for some minutes, he replied. He assimilated it, though. There was no distress exactly, he saw and asked sharply. None that I could see. Pleasurable excitement, something aggressive, a rather wild enthusiasm. His will began to act. He used that curious phrase about wind and fire. He turned alive. He wanted to follow the man. And the face, how would you describe it? Did it bring terror, I mean, or confidence? Dark and splendid, answered the other as truthfully as he could. In a certain sense, rushing, 
tempestuous, yet stern, rather. A face like the heights, suggested Lee Son impatiently. A windy, fiery aspect in it, eh? The man swept past, like the spirit of a storm in imaginative poetry, began the tutor, hunting through his thoughts for adequate description, then stopped as he saw that his companion had risen from his chair and begun to pace the floor. The pastor paused a moment beside him, hands thrust deep into his pockets, head bent down and shoulders forward. For twenty seconds he stared into his visitor's face intently, as though he would force into him the thought in his own mind. His features seemed working visibly, yet behind a mask of strong control. "'Don't you see what it is? Don't you see?' he said in a lower, deeper tone. "'They knew! Even from a distance they were aware of his coming. He is one of themselves.' And he straightened up again. "'He belongs to them.' "'One of them? One of the wind and fire lot?' the tutor stammered. The restless little man returned to his chair opposite, full of suppressed and vigorous movement, as though he were strung on springs. "'He's of them,' he continued, "'but in a peculiar and particular sense. More than merely a possible recruit, his empty organism would provide the very link they need, the perfect conduit.' He watched his companion's face with careful keenness. "'In the country where I first experienced this marvelous thing,' he added significantly, he would have been set apart as the offering, the sacrifice, as they call it there. The tribe would have chosen him with honor. He would have been the special bait to attract. Death, whispered the other. But Lisan shook his head. In the end, perhaps, he replied darkly, for the vessel might be torn and shattered, but at first charged to the brim and crammed with energy, with transformed vitality they could draw into themselves through him, a monster, if you will, but to them a deity, and superhuman in our little sense, most certainly. Then Hendricks faltered inwardly and turned away. No words came to him at the moment. In silence, the minds of the two men, one a religious, the other a secular teacher, and each with the burden of responsibility to the race, kept pace together without speech. The religious, however, outstripped the pedagogue. What he next said seemed a little disconnected with what had preceded it, although Hendricks caught the drift easily enough, and shuddered. An organism needing heat, observed Li Song calmly, can absorb without danger what would destroy a normal person. Alcohol, again, neither injures nor intoxicates, up to a given point, the system that really requires it. The tutor, perplexed and sorely tempted, felt that he drifted with a tide he found it difficult to stem. Up to a point, he repeated. That's true, of course. Up to a given point, echoed the other, with significance that made his voice sound solemn. Then rescue in the nick of time. He waited two full minutes and more for an answer. Then, as none was audible, he said another thing. His eyes were so intent upon the tutors that the latter raised his own unwillingly and understood thus all that lay behind the pregnant little sentence. With a number it would not be possible, but with an individual it could be done. Brim the empty vessel first, then rescue in the nick of time. Regeneration.